Hello everybody, I'm Phil Liggett, joined in commentary later by Paul Sherwin and welcome to Compiègne, the scene of the 100th edition of Paris-Roubaix, an event which spans in fact more than 100 years. It all began back in 1896 when the riders were paced by bicycles and later on by automobiles and after that they went back to bicycles. But now of course they do it all under their own steam. It's a race of 261 kilometres and the day is simply magnificent. Blue skies, although they say at the moment at Roubaix the rain is still falling. Let's hope it's dry when the riders get there. All of the stars are here of course because this is the third round of the World Cup and you know everybody hoping that they might be welcoming the first ever American to win the event, George Hincapie. On three occasions he's made a top six finish, twice fourth, once in sixth position. He's absolutely flying after a marvellous week's racing here in Europe. Well as usual Paul Sherwin is in amongst the riders in the square here in Compiègne so let's catch up with him first. You had a a pretty strange accident this year. You crashed while you were out training. Yeah, that's right. Uh, last Thursday, I was training just easy after Gent Wevelgem. And then there was a big group of, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, school guys who were coming from the other side and uh, didn't watch out and uh, we hit each other. Was there any worry that you might not be able to ride Paris Roubaix? In the beginning, I was worried, but later I went to the hospital, took, the, took some pictures, and there was nothing broken. So then I said, yeah, for sure I'm going to start and then we'll see how it's going. How's the team today? Because it's always uh, Domo Farm Fritz last year totally dominated. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but this year is another year and I think we have a strong team, but uh, maybe not uh, favorite for the for the victory. But uh, with Henkepi and uh, compared to him, Tafi, yeah, there are a lot of guys who have maybe better chances to win. But if we are strong with the with the whole team, we can uh, maybe we can get the, the victory also. Okay, thanks. Bit cold this morning, Matty. Yeah, but the weather's clear. So I heard it's been raining last night, and it's still raining now in the, the final sectors. But we've got a good start today, and it's uh, a lot better than last year, anyway. Georgie seems to be in pretty good shape. Is he accepting the support of the leader of the team, or is the pressure just a little bit too much? No, I think uh, George has been in this position a few times now, and uh, we certainly we didn't give him the help that he deserved last year in Paris Bay. We had a lot of accidents, a little bad luck, but uh, if we can have a minimum bad luck and a little bit of good Good luck, it's going to be a good day for us. George has certainly got the form to win the race today. No worries. George, the big day. You always get excited for Paris Bay. This week has been perfect preparation. Tour of Flanders was good, Gent Wavel game was good, but for you, this is the big one. Yeah, this is um, the race that I trained for all winter and all season. So I'm definitely excited and I feel good and I uh, hope for the best. I believe that you and Lance had a look at some videos this week of the results of uh, Tour. Of Flanders. Yeah, Lance and I uh, watched the video of Tour of Flanders and he had a lot of good things to say and gave me a lot of insight as to what makes him what he is. He's a special guy to have as a teammate and today if you can win you feel as if uh, he will be pushing you along just a little bit even though he's in the United States? He's in the U.S. but I, I know that he's thinking about me and uh, he'll probably be on the phone with me as soon as the race is over so I know that he's there and with me and uh, so is the rest of the team. The team's riding great. I got my family here and a lot of my friends at home watching so um, it's a big day. I hope to do well. The weather is absolutely superb right now. Are you a little bit upset that maybe it's not wet and muddy or is it all the same for you? Well, <clears throat> the weather would probably be the same for me either way, but for, as the dry conditions is better for my team, so it is a, it, it'll probably be better for me in the end. Thank you. Derek, I know you must be nervous today because it's a very important day for the United States Postal Service team, but as an ex-winner of Paris-Roubaix, you must also get pretty excited when you come back to this race. Yeah, always it gives a good feeling if they come back here and compete in a star place. So uh, if, if it's a special race, a uh, special place. Uh, to remember, for me, it's, uh, it's my biggest, my biggest uh, souvenir of my, of my whole career. So but I'm always excited to come back here. You'd like to see George Hincapi win today. Everything's been perfect. Flanders was good. Gen Wevel game. He doesn't right now seem to have any problems. Yeah, he works. He works the whole winter uh, actually for for this day. For uh, so what we saw when the races were passed, uh, he showed that he's uh, right on schedule. He's uh, in, in his top shape. He's, he's, uh, the team is going a lot better than last year. So I think uh, he's ready. We are ready, and uh, we go for it. 
So you've, you've been over to this race several times before. This time you have a good feeling for George? I hope uh, we're gonna, uh, today's going to be the day. The weather's superb at the moment. I asked Georgie, he doesn't care whether it's wet or dry. Everything seems to be spot on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful day. Hopefully it's better for, uh, for the rice. And uh, I hope uh, he'll be up front. <laughs> it, must be, it must be a dream for you because you started life off as a cyclist and then Georgie's followed in your footsteps. But could you ever imagine that Georgie would be a big favorite for Paris-Roubaix? Well, I, I, uh, when he was younger, uh, he used to be, do very good in the races, but I never thought that this was going to be possible. Now I'm very happy because of it. And a little bit nervous today? Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> I am. Thanks, Wall. Well, Stefan, last year was a pretty tough ride in Paris Bay for you. You had a little problem with your pedals. Everything okay today? It was a cleat problem, and uh, this year we fixed everything, I hope. And uh, but you know, and, uh, everything is possible in Paris Bay. It's a kind of race that you and the team are super motivated for, but the team gives you a, a lot, a lot of liberty to ride your own race today. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Eric and I, so uh, we have the same. Uh, uh, point in the team and uh, we see what's in the final okay when we are in the final last two kilometers and Eric is with me so I want to do the sprint for Eric but uh, to there it's 260 kilometers and we see what happened in the race what specifically motivates you about Paris-Roubaix because it is a very special race yes you know I didn't can uh, win the Tour de France but uh, Paris-Roubaix uh, I feel I can win it so I have to be here and I have to be with a good morale and with a good form uh, yeah, that's it. And the weather helps a bit? Uh, for me, it's the same as rain or sun. No difference. Thank you. Ready? Johan, the team seems to be in perfect condition today. A little bit of a worry maybe in the week with the, the crash of Cerves Carnarvon because your team always seems to rely on the strength in numbers. Uh, Friday uh, or, or Tuesday with uh, Cerves has a, a crash, but uh, I think it's going to be not, uh, not so hard as, as we think. So it's, he, he is on the start and uh, his condition is good, but uh, the condition from the team is, uh, is from everybody good. But uh, we don't have the same uh, same strongest team as, as last year, so we have to be another tactic. I see Wilfred Peters is uh, in the team car today. Is that going to be a bit strange for you to see him on that side of the race? Not not only today, but the whole year. It's different uh, for me. Normally, is in my room and on my side uh, with the bicycle, but now now he's uh, backwards in, in the car. Johan, your form is always good. You're still very strong. Are you seriously going to retire at the end of this year, or will we see you maybe one more time in the Ronde van Vlaanderen? We shall see. The museum is always full of surprises. You are not Peter, last week was Tour of Flanders, the form was good. How's this week been preparing for Paris-Roubaix? Um, I did uh, Gant Wevelgem for training, and then uh, Thursday we did uh, the last 100 km from uh, Paris-Roubaix. Then always resting. Is your motivation for Paris-Roubaix the same as it is for Tour of Flanders? It's one of the big classics, but maybe Flanders you feel a little bit more obliged to win because you're Belgian. Yeah, but I think uh, Roubaix is uh, almost Belgium also. So, but well, Tour de Flanders is I like more uh, the cobbles and the hills, but uh, I like also Paris Roubaix. You seem very motivated, very relaxed. I tried to talk to Johan Museo this morning, and he's just locked in the car, not talking to anybody. Yeah, I'm always. I'm not so stressed and uh, for me uh, I'm good so I'm more stressed when the condition is not good so 
I will see uh, when I have not a lot of problems. Normally, I must have a good race. Okay. Well, Freddie, right now you're in third place in the World Cup. Are you going to try and go for points today, or are your responsibilities a little bit more with the team and Johan Museo? Well, my responsibilities are pretty much to be there, to be there at the finale. You know, Johan's riding incredibly well. I'm riding well. Servas is riding well. I think with, with the whole team, as long as we have the numbers there, I think I'll still be able to get points, and uh, who knows? You know, it's my first Rebe, but I think I, I have really good legs. Pave seems to you know, suit me well, and... Uh, I, you never know. I mean, I could win the race. <laughs> Carnarvon had a very strange accident this week. Was there a worry that he might not start? No, not at all. I mean, the accident was just more and more bruises and everything else. Just, you know, we, not, no, it just threw him off one day of training, but not much. Dreams of winning today? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the, one of my biggest dreams in uh, in my cycling career, and uh, and it's my first one, so. I come in with the best form I've had in, uh, in a long time, so you never know. I mean, yeah, I do have dreams. Well, Max, round once again to the Classics and Paris Bay, a race that you've always fancied that you've got a chance of winning. Uh, yeah, again, I'm here. Good condition, good morale. I don't want to say the same things as every year, but you know, it's such a difficult race. You need so much luck. But uh, I feel really good today. I think, I hope at least in 14 years it could be my day. <laughs> You've got a good team around you. Dirksen seems to be riding well. He had a bit of bad luck in the Tour of Flanders. Mm -hmm. 12 months ago, the two of you worked very well in the Classics. Yeah, we had, we had a good, uh, good Classic in Tour of Flanders and Roubaix. And, you know, the morale is still good. The condition is really good. It's it's a good day today. I mean, I didn't mind rain or I didn't. I don't mind anything. It's just Paris Roubaix, is Paris Roubaix. But all I need is a bit of luck. That's all I, I'm asking for today. That's the thing about Paris Roubaix. It's not really good luck. It's just not having bad luck. Yeah, just cutting over the first few sections, three or four sections with the uh, no inconvenience. You know, no flats, no no crashes, no nothing. So it's all. Uh, it's all energies you keep for the end, you know, why is you kind of catching up all the time, you know, in the first sections. So, you know, just get over the first three or four sections of Pavé in good health with a good bike and then we'll see. Luda, a brilliant day today for Pai Roubaix. Your teammate Max Chiandri seems to be in good form. You two had a little bit of bad luck last week in the Tour of Flanders, but today's another day. Yeah, today is another day. It's a beautiful day, but... Uh too beautiful perhaps eh? <laughs> no last year it was uh, the weather was uh, bad and uh, the roads were very bad but this year uh, I think uh, there are some uh, more races who want to win but you just love the cobblestones we've seen you in Tour of Flanders we've seen you in Paris Bay once you get to the cobblestones you have to give it full gas yeah, it's I, I I love the cobblestones and uh, one time I, I want to win uh, Paris Roubaix and uh, I try to do it and uh, yeah let's we'll see today I try it. Well, we hope you win because we're in the same hotel as you tonight. Maybe we have a big celebration. Oh yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, <thanks>. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> Pass up. <laughs> hey Robbie, the spirits seem pretty good this morning. Um, obviously, yeah. I mean, my form's been good up until now. Had a good race in Flanders and Wevelgem, so, you know, obviously motivated for today. Andrea Taffy, since winning last week in the Tour of Flanders, seems to have had a pretty low-key week. Um, yeah, he has, uh, but I think Andrea is, is a lot more motivated than, uh, than he was before Flanders. He wasn't expecting to ride that well in Flanders, obviously, then winning it. Uh, it's obviously up to his morale a lot more as well for today, so he's confident. And obviously, that with the team that we've got here, um, the team's really expecting good results. Last year, Mappé had a pretty bad time in Paris-Roubaix. It's a race that the team has always been super motivated for. Everybody in form now? Yeah, um, everybody's in form, and apart from that, um, you know, the team's getting on well, which I think last year the team was lacking a bit. There was, you know, I think maybe too many too many captains and a bit of con you know, conflict in the team. This year we know what we've got to do, and I think the results will come. Thanks, Paul. Come on, come on. 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 Come
Tu non lo sai lo sito, Baco, sei capito? Andrea Taffy, a very popular man at the start of Paris-Roubaix. Today, Andrea, today's a big day for you, Paris-Roubaix. Maybe you're just a little bit more relaxed after your win last week in the Tour of Flanders. I'm, I'm very happy, actually, to have won last week in Tour of Flanders. But I would be even happier because today is one of the races that I really love the most. I'd really hope today that I've got a good race. Your team also is very strong. You've got Zanini, Narnedo, and even uh, the young South African, Robbie Hunter. Yes, the whole team are riding very well, very strong at the moment. But this year, I think for us that's quite important. For me personally, today, there are two objectives. First of all is to win the race, and secondly is of course uh, I'm thinking about the World Cup. Oh, you slow oh, come on, Joe. This is a joke, man. I've never been so late getting away from Paris Rubay before. It's going to be a great start. All the big guys are here. A big surprise to see Cervais Canavan, but you know, that's Paris Rubay. <coughs> Well, the ride is now well into the saddle of 100th at Paris-Roubaix, and as you can see, it was only around 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the start. It's not a lot warmer now, some 100 kilometers down the road. The ride is bound for the cobblestones, and it's nice to see, Paul, US Postal have got themselves right on the front of the peloton to start with. Well, I think they're completely dedicated to the victory today of George Hincapi. Hincapi in great shape, but there is this very early morning breakaway. Right in the middle of the screen there is Robbie Hunter, the South African. He was very relaxed at the start this morning, Phil, and I think today he will be very happy with the situation that he's managed to get himself in that early season breakaway. Tristan Hoffman in there as well, Tom Boonen, the man from Belgium, the young star on the US Postal Service team coming forward. This is a very large group right now, Phil. There are still 19 sections of cobblestones to go and that's almost 25 miles of those very bad and treacherous roads. Well, as always, a lot of sections of cobblestones to be conquered and they come in stretches. As we see the banners coming at us, there's one in the distance there. It counts down from 26 to 0. And the peloton here under the tempo and the command of George Hincapi because although they've got Tommy Boonen in the breakaway, he's not the man, of course, that is expected to win this race. He's the early season pacemaker for the team. And uh, the cobbles, well, they're probably turning in favour of Ludo Dierksen's here because they are a lot wetter than I think any of them expected them to be today. Well, it's a big shock, you know, this rain has come down from Holland and Belgium in the last couple of hours. Most of these riders will have ridden this course fill over the last week, just looking at these cobblestones, and they will have found them completely dry. But very often, when the rain comes in at the last moment like this, it makes it so much worse because it makes them very slippery. Now, some hard working being done here. We're now at main two and a half kilometres of cobblestones here, Pave Sector 9. As we're looking here at Enrico Cassani, Unusual to see a man like Cassani riding so well, but he's proved to be quite a driving power in this breakaway today. Hunter there, taking the rest of the line down the centre of the cobblestones. You've got two places to ride, really, on the edges or on the centre. They are, if anything, the safest sector. It's great to see Robbie Hunter on the front of this main field as well, Phil. I think a lot more happy now that he's left the Lampre team and come along to this huge big squad of Team Mappé. And he slipped into the, the role of assistant leader very easily, I think, with his very great start to the season in the Tour de Lankawi. A chance to see all of the breakaway down there now. A very interesting move. Quite a big move this for this stage of the race. Uh, as Robbie Hunter has put himself in a very strong position. Now, this is a race he is expected by his team to ride pretty well in. Looking down there, the lotto rider is Hans de Klerk in the red jersey, about four men down in the line just now. 
There's 123 kilometers already covered today of the 256, and Hunter looking as though he just can't be tamed at all today, Paul. He just wants to get this race going. Well, this is a good move for these guys. They got away in the habitual early morning breakaway of Paris-Roubaix, but the fact is this is a very large group, and because it's such a large group, we could in fact see a surprise in Paris-Roubaix today, and this group actually surviving to the finish, which is why they're riding so hard just now. They want to try and blow this group apart because obviously with such a large group fill there are so many riders who will sit on the back one team who've done very well here in fact is the small French team there you can see Big Matt Aubervilliers they've actually got four riders in this leading group well, there's Kasani on the left he has a teammate up here as well in Maxi van Heesvik let me just tell you how this breakaway got away at about 144 kilometers from the finish before they got to the first feed at Solem Kasani van Heeswick, both Domo, Bedrogi of Mappe, Hans de Klerk, Lotto, Raphael Schweder of the Team Coast, Tristan Hoffman of Team CSC, uh, Tom Boonen of US Postal. They were the men who set up the action. They've since now been joined by the rest of this breakaway. And it looks to me as though this is a very interesting move here, starting so far out with some good riders in it before we get to the forest itself. Well, Domo Farm Fritz, uh, with the winner from last year, Cerves Carnarvon, on the start line, I think will be very happy with this situation, Phil. As we look at Enrico Cassani here, he's absolutely hammering over these cobblestones, but they've got a great bike rider in the leading breakaway, and that's Max van Hazewijk. If this group was to stay clear, Max has got a very good chance of winning because he's a very complete bike rider. Well, that's Tom Boonen down there, the revelation. The young man who has ridden so well, under 23 champion of Belgium, and uh, Johan Brunil, and there's a rider punctured on there. I think it's Hunter gone. Well, that's bad luck. I'm sure that's Robbie Hunter with a flat tyre. Oh, that is so unfortunate. You see right now the main field is a long way farther behind this man, and he's getting service from the neutral service vehicle there, that ye yellow bike there. Robbie Hunter, South Africa, stuck at the side of the road now. Now, that is so unfortunate, Phil, because his form was superb. He was riding at the front, and this is a very slow change. It's taken around about 40 seconds yeah. so far, so I don't think we'll see Robbie Hunter get back into this group again. I can't see how he can now. We're about 115 kilometres from the finish here, and and our breakaway is down to just 14 from the original 16. I think Danilo Honda has also come to grief. We didn't see it, but he's no longer here in the breakaway. So that really is bad luck. Hans de Klerk bringing them off that sector of cobblestones. And they're really getting themselves settled into this now. Boone in there doesn't really want to put too much power in this breakaway, of course. He wants to see Hincapi make it up here sooner or later. We've still got 33.7 kilometres of rough road to go. Max van Heeswijk to the right of our picture, his teammate uh, Kasani just on the left of our picture. They're riding very well, and Domo need a good result too. This is Boonen on the front. This is a man I think we're going to talk an awful lot about in the future. He worked very hard for George Hincapie last week in the Tour of Flanders, and he came up then in the middle of the week, Phil, in ghent Wevelgem with a brilliant seventh place. I think this young man, just 21 years of age, is a man that US Postal are going to nurture over the next few years. Well, chance now for Big Matt, who's not uh, part of the Tour de France line this year, but hoping for a wild card. This is Sebastian Talabarden of the uh, Big Matt team. Sitting at the back here of this group as we're heading on to the what looks like sector, I can't quite read, that looks like sector 15 of the cobblestones. Another greasy sector now, sector 19 it was. Well these sections fill for the moment are very long indeed, you can see that's 2,500 metres, that's around about 1.7 miles. But I think it's the latter sections which are going to be much more testing for these riders because those are the ones which are going to be very muddy indeed. This young man right now is on a suicide mission, I think, Enrico Cassani on the frontier. He's thinking about the presence of his teammate, Max van Heesewijk, in this group. Van Heesewijk looking very comfortable. The red and white jersey there is Tristan Hoffman, the big Dutchman, who's having a very good season this year on CSC Tiscali. The team of Tyler Hamilton. Hamilton we expect to see later on in the year, as now he will have to assume the role of leader of that team when we come through to the Grand Tours. Well, Cassandra only have had one win, that was uh, the 12th stage of the Giro d'Italia uh, back in, 19, in the year 2000. Uh, but he had a good result last week in the Tour of Flanders, taking seventh place, so he's going to make the best use of those strong legs by the look of it. He's going to have to hold off the Raiders because US Postal, although they've got one man up front, they're not expecting him to stay there. They're going to look after George Hincapie. I would say, Paul, the aim to try and get close to the bunch, the breakaway rather, as we near the Forest of Arenberg. 
Well, that would be the plan, you could, because that, to me, is always a very critical stage of Paris-Roubaix. The forest of Arenberg is not always the place where this bike raid is won, but it's a place where you can very often lose all possibility of contact with the front group. So the main field will pick up their accelerations as we get closer to the forest of Arenberg and try and blow the race apart. But you know, the main breakaway of the day is looking very serious right now with two very strong riders from Domo Farm Fritz in there. Little chance to look at the cobbles here. The rain is still coming down, not very heavily. It's just in the wind, really, at the moment. You see one or two of the umbrellas there, but the wind is quite strong. It's head to cross. It's not that favourable just now. And this little stretch of cobblestones here behaving itself for the moment. Best way is down the middle. If you look to the right or left, you come off the edge of the cobblestones, and they are real traps for the bike rider. The small wheels, when they try to come back onto the cobbles out of the ditch, uh, often they slip and slide, and down they go. Well, there's another problem. Uh, looks there. like somebody's gone down here. This will be uh, this will be the big mat rider in trouble now. This will be a uh, Talabarden. Well, that's bad news for them. They had four riders in that leading group, and again, a very unfortunate slow change for this man. In fact, it's Sivakov who's got in there. They've got four riders in this leading group, and they've had that just reduced now by one. There is confirmation it is the Russian rider, yep. but that was a slow change for him, and another man who's probably not going to see the front of the bike race again today. Well, I, I suspect, too, even the mechanics changing wheels, the hands are going to be pretty cold here to get those wheels in quick. This is indeed Alexei Sivakov, a Russian rider on Big Math, and as Paul has said, they're well represented up here, but they are hoping, and I, I think it's a, an extreme hope, to get a wild card place in the Tour de France. Well, they have another good man in that leading group, a man who's been a professional for an awful long time. We've seen him many times on the roads of the Tour de France, Thierry Gouverneau. Looking at the front here, this is Max van Hazewijk. Right behind him is Boonen. There's another Mappe rider a little bit further back there. So this group now just recovering a little bit, Phil, once we've come off the cobblestones. Well, good old Max. He's been around a while now, but he's a great bike rider. Stage winning the Tour of Spain a couple of years ago. And uh, they're not overextending themselves here. In fact, one or two now trying to assess uh, what the situation is here and looking who is still around them. Originally, they were 16 leaders, but they thinned down a little bit now, and all because of flat tyres, of course, and they've been passed down the bunch. And it's a shame about Robbie Hunter because, really, poor old Robbie wants one day to survive this uh, without any bad luck because I think he's a real candidate, a sort of bike rider who could win this race. But here we are now, 119 kilometres. It's a long way still to ride to the finish. And uh, believe me, this is not going to be the composition of the winning group. This is Thierry Gouverneau on the front right now. We've seen him so many times in the past. The Mappe rider there, just in third position, he's a man we need to watch out for in the future as well. That's Laszlo Bodrogi. He's a brilliant young bike rider. I think a bit surprised that he's lost his teammate in this breakaway situation. But today, Mappe will be thinking about a couple of their riders who are on excellent form right now, Andrea Taffy and, of course, Stefano Zanini. But they're back in the main field at the moment. And this is the front group here. Good, hard-working group. Most interesting attack, this one, because one or two riders have good reputations. It is not the usual throwaway group that we've come to see in the early stages could be a very dangerous group this heading on now to pave 18 as the smaller as the figures go down uh, then we get closer to the finish and this is now a very nice and a bit of trouble here at the back and it looks as though the Rabobank rider's got himself a few problems well, I think the big dangerous thing that happened today was they allowed a group of almost 30 riders to go off the front of the main field and that is a difficult group to pull back there's also a bit of tactical maneuvering going on in the back because I think Domo Farm Freets are quite happy to have Max van Hazewijk in this leading breakaway right now because he's got great form for the moment and they will sit back and wait and see if it all comes back together. Surveys Canava, we know, had that terrible injury in the middle of the week. He actually had a silly crash while out training. He actually crashed with a bunch of school kids out on the road and initially, Phil, he actually thought that he'd broken his elbow. And we, for one, certainly thought he wouldn't be on the start line today. So it's good to see the defending champion here, but for the moment in the main field. Well, certainly, if he had not been the defending champion, he wouldn't have bothered to turn up. But he felt obliged, and uh, we thank him for that. It, the rumour was absolute that on the eve of the race he was not coming. And uh, so we were very surprised when we saw him ride across the town square uh, to sign on. But here we are, and it looks as though they're getting back on this occasion, at least Sven Nice, who's a very good uh, cyclocross rider, should be enjoying these conditions here as they slowly move back up to this group at the back of the field, because just look at the length of that bunch now, they're in big trouble here at the back. It's quite strange, actually, after a certain 
certainly after so many sections of cobblestones, to have such a large group intact. But it will be very difficult in the last hour of racing as we zigzag across the north of France because the wind will change at so many times from headwind to tailwind to crosswind and that's when I think this race will absolutely be blown to smithereens. It is a very difficult day. You, strangely enough, you can see almost blue skies but this rainstorm that came through has done enough damage to make this a very tricky and treacherous course. And this shot here gives you an idea of just how fast these bike riders are going right now, Phil. I remember one year when I didn't take part in Paris Roubaix it was a race that I always loved but I was injured on the Thursday beforehand and I went to watch this bike race from the side of the road and I was amazed at how fast the bike riders go actually on the machine you don't get any idea that you're going as quickly as this yes they clatter their way through and hope their equipment holds up and he's up to the day if you go back up to the leaders now there's still 14 of them left on the frontier Bedrogi of Mape and uh, nice everybody seems willing to work and keep this pace nice and steady to organize themselves and keep it going very important this uh, it's Tom back down there the champion of uh, Lithuania or Latvia I think it is and Pedro Horilo is the other Mape rider in this breakaway Mape will be happy with this situation although for the moment their big names are at the back of the race Andrea Taffy and Daniele Nardello and Stefano Zanini. This group now has been reduced in numbers and that's exactly what they wanted, Phil. That's why they hit the first section of cobblestones just as hard as they could. Once you reduce the numbers in the size of a group, then you're going to get more, comp more participation at the front end from everybody because they now realise they've got a very good chance of surviving if they stay together and work as one unit. Still approaching, of course, the infamous uh, Forest of Aremberg. We're not there yet. And the weather has not uh, abated at all. We keep going through these little rainstorms, then it goes off, then we catch up with it again because we keep changing our direction without making a great deal of progress at times, it seems. And they're uh, saying now 4 minutes 38 back to the peloton itself, which is down to about 70 riders. And in that group, and in fact doing most of the work, US Postal with their uh, man George Hincapi still in a very strong position. They're the 14 men. We've just lost from this group uh, Danilo Hondo and Robbie Hunter, both with flat tyres, and that's a shame. But you see the echelon forming, indicating it's a slight crosswind here, diagonal wind across the course, and the riders just doing uh, through and off, keeping the tempo nice and steady, nice and high, and uh, I think they're doing a pretty good job, and this is the most interesting formula for today's race. There's Nico Matin, the coffeeless rider, right in the middle of the field there. Enrico Cassano very urgently always coming to the front. At Hasbro now, 116 kilometres to go. We keep getting information, Phil, that at the front of the main field, the work is being done by the US Postal Service. Now, I think that's just a little bit too early to start really taking control of this bike race. I would have thought that they wanted to conserve as much energy to have as many people with George Hincapie for as long as possible, because after all, that's always been George's weakness in the past, not having any teammates up alongside him in the finales. Yes, I agree. There are other teams also want to win this race, and uh, like Domo, for example. And oh, there's a puncture here. Is this Max van Heeswijk who's gone down? Looks like it could be. They're saying it's Johan Museo, so we're obviously back with the bunch here. This is Johan Museo with a flat tyre at Hasp. Good change for him, and now let's see how he gets on. There's no sign of any teammates waiting for him. Bit of an empty road ahead, but he's up and running. There's no sign of any panic either. This man, the Flemish Lion, certainly has been in this situation many times before. You see, he's not even relaxing. Look at the way he's got, his, he's got his glasses perched on the end of his nose right there. He waited for the moment to have the team car fill right behind him, takes out the front wheel. Not an inch of panic at all in this man, but you can be certain the information has gone through to the team and they will be dropping men back one at a time. A couple of years ago, Johan Museo had an awful lot of bad luck in this bike race and in fact he's picking his way through the cars nice and carefully for the moment just one teammate there in front slowing down to pace him back into the group absolutely perfect and uh, as Paul says no panic sign of a very experienced professional Pave sector 17 here now the Museo very smartly back in the group but having to decide what to do about this breakaway of 14 men just now as they continue to lead as they have done now from very early on this is 1,700 metres, this stretch of cobbles here at Hasp. Line astern, you can't really get by riders on cobblestones. You just sit there and keep making the pace and following the wheels in front. Otherwise, you start bouncing off the roadside like uh, Tom back there. 
Well, looks like Serves Carnarvon there just in front of Johan Museo. He's waited for his team leader and captain, and he's pacing him back to the front end of the main field because Museo, an experienced man as he is, will not want to sit at the back end of this peloton. And strangely enough, at the start this morning, it was very interesting to note the man in the team car for Domo Farm Freak today was none other than Wilfred Peters. Now, that's a big change for Wilfred Peters, who last year was the serious animator of this bike race. Yes, he most certainly was. And in fact, Museo is saying how much he misses him now in the bike racing scene because they used to room together in the hotels at night. But uh, age catches up, of course, and Peters is out this year. And no doubt Johan Museo in the next two seasons will also have retired. Back to the leaders here now. Tom Back is the man choosing his own little trail up on the right there. As we look at the others, all sitting nicely in a straight line. It's actually good to see Tom Back riding so well because I do believe he had a little talking to from the team management over the last couple of days, uh, Alain Bondu, who's his team manager, and also, as you know, for my best man, was there at the team hotel to have a word with Tom Back, who he felt was not being quite as serious as he should be, and it looks as if that talking to has worked because he's found himself today in the leading breakaway. Well, good for him because he's wearing the champion jersey of his country, and everybody wants to do that credibility, or give that credibility, rather. It's amazing how we were standing in the square in rather nice conditions. We did not envisage that the weather was going to turn quite so badly as it has done. But the rain now fairly persistent. And this breakaway has made a good move. Here's Tom Back, the rider we've been talking about. Just hanging on to the coattails now. Well, he's at the back there. It's a very dangerous position to ride too because you're at the risk of the rider in front of you deviating very smartly out of the way and being left with a hole right in front of you. So that's the, the worst place possibly to ride. The best place is right in the middle of the cobblestones if you've got the strength, that is, to be able to do it. And some men who keep consistently going to the front are men like Tristan Hoffman, who's in this breakaway, Phil. He's a very good bike rider and I think having one of his best seasons. The two Mappe riders now at the back of that group seem to be suffering a bit of difficulty. Kansani on the other side there, he's taking a few risks as well, riding along that very slippery, slick line of mud down the edge of the cobblestones an Italian riding high turned professional back in 1997 he's having a great season this year seventh in the Tour of Flanders one of the few Italians rides on the foreign team of course because he rides the Belgian Domo team that's the rider on the far left of our picture blazing his own personal trail this is Tom back here just hanging on very difficult to follow here he doesn't see any of the pitfalls coming his way and there's mud there which will be thrown up into his face. The best place to be, if you can hold it, is on the front. And well, Rillo is having a bit of difficulty here, Phil. You see that acceleration right now. And the thing about riding the cobblestones is once you start to weaken, it's really a question of no lights and no sound at all. In fact, it wasn't a problem with his legs. It was a problem with his bike there. He stopped at the side of the road. The neutral service is right in alongside him. They're trying to change his rear wheel. And once again, because of these very dramatic conditions, these wheel changes seem to be taking forever. That's just a shame again. Another man being left on the roadside, and he's getting pretty upset here. There's the flag of Flanders as the leading riders go through. And again now, they're down to 13 riders now. But I don't think Harillo is going to get back on this pull. He's going to have a hard time because they won't slow down and wait for him. If you do have a problem, the worst place to have it is actually on the cobblestone section because once you get onto the smooth part of the road, the other riders pick up their pace, and it's so difficult and dangerous at the back because all the cars are coming by you. Um, the difficult thing, too, is picking up your momentum, and he seems to have got a problem. And in fact, I don't think the chain is on right now, and yeah. he's not very happy with that at all. It is a mess, I'm afraid, and Pedro Harillo is not going to get back now. He sorted the chain problems out. He's still ahead of the field, of course, but this has cost him, I would say, 45 seconds or so. He'll be lucky to bridge that back. In the distance there is the crowd. You can see the helicopter way ahead. Well, that's where the riders are now. It's flying above the leaders. He's back in the main field, and it's still filled on the front end of the main field, the blue and red jerseys of US Postal Service, trying to set something up for Georgie Hincapie, but they're still around about four minutes in arrears of that leading breakaway. It's going to be difficult, I think, for them to pull that breakaway back before the Forest of Arenberg. But still for the main field, there's a crash at the back uh -oh. here. This is the chaos. This is the fighting for position. There's a rider from Faso Bortolo gone down there, and you can see, in fact, there is Jans Kortz, the champion of Holland too, who's got a bit of a problem. Yes, he looks as though he's hurt himself there, poor old Jans, Dutch road racing champion. A little bit of a shunt at the rear of the peloton. Lance will be okay when he can sort his chain out. 
That's a real shame. We've also uh, had messages that uh, Eric Zabel has had a flat tyre in that group as well. So there's another big name having problems once more this year. Now, look at the we swing to the back of the race here at the moment. This is uh, Karsten Kroon, who was in the leading group and is now beginning to lose ground. It looks as though there's one or two going backwards now because this is Ludovic Auger. I think it was Ludovic Auger also uh, coming away from the leading group. So the distance now is hurting them and they're having a job going with the pace on the sectors of Parve as we try and get through here up to the, besides the car here of the organisation. Get an idea to see just how difficult it is on these cobblestone sections and it, it really is a pretty sight. That's a sight very reminiscent of the Tour de France right now. That group feel all of the time now being reduced in numbers when we go over the cobble sections and a lot of that really is due to the accelerations on the front of that man from Italy, Enrico Cassani. But it's amazing to see that this young 21-year-old Belgian from the US Postal Service is in there right now. Now this is great for George Hincapie because hopefully if the plan unfolds correctly we'll see Hincapie coming out of the group when we come to the forest of Arenberg and then he'll have a teammate in the front, Tom Boonen, who's riding superbly over this last week of Belgian classics. And this, in fact, is his last race before they put him to rest for a month. And at 21 years of age, I think he's had a brilliant start to the season. Absolutely. Well, that would be the perfect solution for sure. 30 kilometres, 19 miles still to run on cobblestones. There's a nice picture of Tom Boonen on the front there. Discovered a couple of years ago by Johan Brunil and... Uh, now he's starting to come good as a first-year pro. He can go over his shoulder there, checking out the opposition is Nico Matan. He's here for the Cofidis team. He's a Some dangerous good man. Here. He's a dangerous man to he let is. get in a breakaway like this because we've seen him ride so well in the past in Paris-Roubaix and, of course, in the Tour of Flanders. And if you give him a three- or four-minute advantage by the time this race gets to the Forest of Arenberg, that's a very good possibility for that man to come up with the surprise win. He's got a teammate in the main field as well, who's also a contender for today's race, that's Joe Plankart. But back with the main field at zone number 17, it's still in control of the main peloton, the US Postal Service, and they are not eating into the advantage at all. You saw there, no. 4 minutes and 28 seconds. Looking up at the leaders, I think, yes, we are back with the leaders now. The roads are getting quite slippery here. And there's another puncture on the left of the road. I didn't catch who it was, Paul, but he's gone from the breakaway. Well, I is think this, the main this is a group, this is the main this is a field, group in between, yeah, because that's Joe Plankart on the yeah. right-hand side there. And this is the oh, chaos of the main field. You can see just having a bit of a difficult time there as well was Stefan Bart, who was the leader of the small Saint-Quentin team. He actually raced with Lance Armstrong's US Postal Service team, and he seems now to be slipping slowly down the ladder, a former national champion of France. And he got caught out there, and once you're on the side there, you're in big trouble now as these are all the riders now, all sorts of difficulty, not just the distance now, but everything else. Uh, this is uh, Garrick Garden, he was up with the leaders, and now we're looking here at the race beginning to fragment. This to be expected, they've lost all of their coordination for the moment, and we're not too far away now from entry into the forest. Well, that's going to be a big charge, but these guys will survive today, Phil. They will go into the Forest of Arenberg in the first few places because they still have a huge advantage over the main field. Always riding fairly close to the back is Thierry Gouvenu, but he's a very clever rider. We've actually seen him in the early morning breakaway in Paris-Roubaix in the past, and he survived to finish high in the standings. There you can see Laszlo Bodrogi, a brilliant young bike rider, had a very good start to the season this year with a win in the opening prologue of Paris-Nice. But this group, whenever they get off the cobblestones, are doing a good job. They're getting themselves together, getting themselves organised. The black board on the right-hand side there, you can see still indicating over four minutes their advantage over the main field. 13, a baker's dozen now, left of the original breakaway. And Tom Boonen still driving on at the front, which is interesting to note, hoping that they will get into the forest first. He's hoping, of course, US Postal eventually will close this down, but not with the whole peloton, preferably with just a group of them uh, to start what could develop into a winning move. Well, they'll all be getting nervous in the main field right now. Hincapie's got some pretty strong guys to help him out on this race today. 
Pavel Podronos, who used to be a lead-out man for Mario Cipollini, has now come across to the U.S. Postal Service. This is Thierry Gouverneur at the back, wearing number 231. A sensible rider, very experienced bike rider. We've seen him at the Tour de France. He's keeping himself right now topped up with as much food as possible because you certainly don't want to crack, especially on a wet, cold day like this. You really seem to have to eat just that little bit more than you would normally. As well, Gouverneur will have his 33rd birthday in May which isn't too far away, and uh, he's been a pro then now for this will be his 11th season, a 12th season as a pro, he turned pro back in 1991 to the Guru, so he's had a very good long career, not a big winner, he's only had a couple of wins throughout his career, but he's been a pretty reliable teammate. You see the rain starting to come down once again, Nico Matin has dressed up for the really cold days there with a ski hat over the top of his head, keeping himself as warm as possible, looking very strong and confident there as well. But I think at the moment, once we get to the smoother sections in between the cobblestones, the order of the day is to eat as much as possible. There's Van Hezewijk in the blue jersey of Domo. A brilliant bike rider, Max Van Hezewijk, and also a very interesting character too. Before he turned to the sport of professional bike racing, he actually possessed a black belt in karate. So the answer is don't mess with Max, I would say, and that's, if that's the case, Paul. Looking here at the back of the race now, uh, back of the breakaway, rather, this is the team coast rider, Raphael Schweda, who's, uh, he's done some, of, is it the back of the race? This, this bunch is so big that uh, at the moment it looks as though it was the bunch in that angle. This is Laszlo Bodrogi, number 33 there, the lotto rider, Hans de Klerk, been in the break since the outset today. Still got a couple of big mat riders here. Numerically, they're in a good good situation because, like a lot of the French teams, they're not in the Tour de France yet. And frankly, I don't think they'll be part of the wild cards anyway unless they pull off some rather spectacular performances in the next couple of events. Well, there are a lot of teams vying for selection at the Tour de France later in this year. Teams like Team Coast, who I think during the early season classics have been very good indeed. We have to wait and see how they'll perform in the, in the stage races that will indicate whether they can be competitive at the Tour de France. Races like the Pays Basque race and Dauphiné Libre. Then after that, we'll get an idea as to whether or not they will garner selection. Now, oh, this is uh, Nicola Libero as the big man. Actually, rider this is here, a chase away. This is, this this is, is a group back coming group, across. This yes. is Joe Plancard, who a few moments ago they'd said was in difficulty. Well, right now he's in a small three man group, Phil, trying to get himself across to the breakaway. Now, this is a good move by Joe Plancard. He's actually not waiting to be dragged up to the front breakaway by the US Postal Service train, and he slipped away from the main peloton. Well, Hats off to Plankert. He's a man who's almost made it this year, but hasn't yet delivered with the goods. Paul Van Heeft is another rider in this breakaway. And this rider here, Joe Plankert, will be happy to work with him because it could steal a march and put him up in the lead group before any of the fancied men get up there. Good move by Joe, but he, he's so close to winning big races, Joe, but he's always in the second or third when he gets the line. There's always somebody who actually gets the better of him just before the line there. The Tiscali rider, Paul Van Haight, good strong workhorse, he's up there as well. Back with the breakaways, the men they are trying to reach uh, were slowly but surely heading in towards the forest now. Well, there's still 14 very strong riders at the front end of this bike race, but it seems to me now, Phil, as if the turns that are being done at the front are not quite as hard and in earnest as they were just a little while ago. This breakaway, when it originally formed, was 33 riders strong, and since then it's slowly but surely been whittled down to a small nucleus of men prepared to work hard. Over 100 kilometres to go as we head through Denain, and in fact, they've got to do a fairly large little loop around Denain with the main field, closing in a little bit, but not fast enough to four minutes and seven seconds. Yes, it's the old story. They're nibbling, nibbling away at it, but they're not rushing at them. And they want to see, though, where they stand when they get to the forest, because many people feel that's where the race begins. Once you traverse the forest, then you're facing up to a more or less a 100-kilometre run straight down to the finish. Uh, but, of course, all the cobbles are there as well. Now, back at the team car here. This is Thomas Eriksson of CSC Tiscali, and that looks like Bjorn Arise in the driving seat today, the man who won the Tour de France uh, back in 1996. Bjorn Arise now uh, driving the team car, a very experienced man, and he's come into the top of the CSC Tiscali team. And in fact, he uh, went out and stuck his neck on the line last year and signed up Tyler Hamilton across from the US Postal Service. And he'll be looking after Tyler when he comes up to ride in the Tour de France later on this season. 
This group now, Phil, I think will wait until they get to the forest of Arenberg, and then once they come out of the forest, they will see what the composition of the group looks like and wait to get information from behind. Just there's another problem about Kasani stopping at the side of the road yeah. there. He was very quick there. He pulled up. He saw, in fact, that there was the yellow neutral bike right behind him, and he stopped at the side of the road. In fact, you're supposed to stop on the left-hand side of the road, but in such chaos in Paris-Roubaix, sometimes the judges look the other way. He's got a quick bike change now, a wheel change. He's in there, and with a bit of luck, very shortly, he'll be back in the group with his teammate, Max van Heeswijk. Well, big effort required from Enrico now to put himself back in, but he's got great legs just now. It's been a good few weeks for him in the bike game, and he's going to make the most of that as he tries to get back on terms. He chose the smooth section of the road, or I think the problem probably came on the cobbles, but he held it long enough to get a good bike change. He's now nearly into the convoy of cars, and then he can work his way through up back to that leading group. Don't think it'll be a problem for him this time. He's not too sure which way to pass around this car at the moment. A bit of a traffic jam up front in these narrow streets as we're heading up towards the area of Wallers and the forest of Arenberg. Kasani now sensing that he's on the tail of the convoy. He just breathes between cars, you see. A few deep breaths and then races around them. Another deep breath and keeps on going till he rejoins the front group. At the minute, we've got some 13 riders. We've only got 12 at the moment up there. 12 riders as we look down, 104 kilometres, no more than that now from the top, uh, from the finishing line. And uh, I can tell you that the weather too at the finish is still pretty grim as well. So there's no rest for them just now. And they look, uh, they look as though they've been on Pairi Bay now. One or two of the riders looking quite uh, dirty here. There's Boonen coming through. Still got his long sleeve jersey. Mac van Heeswijk cruising through on the inside. Great guy, Max, when you meet him. He speaks very, very good English and uh, always seems to have a twinkle in his eye when he, when he talks to him. This is Kasani, hats off, good chase, and there is Tom Boonen taking a little break on the left, but of a different sort, and he sensed perhaps a little relaxation here in this breakaway group now as they prepare to enter the forest, and that might be interesting. Thomas Eriksson was the rider there from, from CSC, again trying to do something about this move. Well, I think they'll back off just a little bit now, Phil, because they realise they're coming up to the forest of Arenberg, and it's a a section of cobblestones which really strikes fear into the hearts of most, but most bike riders, even the most earnest of bike riders. Men like Johan Museo has got some terrible memories about the forest of Arenberg. It nearly cost him his life a couple of years ago. So all of these guys, I think, will just back off a little bit, try and recuperate. Maybe it's a good time for a drink and something to eat to get themselves psychologically prepared for what is an unbelievably treacherous section of road. It's about two and a half kilometres in length, but it seems to take forever. Kasani now reporting back to the team management to say, well, there you go, had a flat tyre, back in the main field, no problems, thank you very much. Forest of Arenberg coming up next. He's probably saying, where on earth is Johan, because we could do with some help up here. Meanwhile, back in the cavalry department, this is the main field. There's only around 60 of them left already here, believe it or not. And it is the US Postal doing a lot of work, and I hope they're not overworking here. Antonio Cruz on the front there, a brilliant young bike rider. I think really enjoying the fact that he's working here with some top men. Stefano Zanini very much up there as well. The leading group of 14 rider going through this section now, section number 16 at Havalui, 2.5 kilometres in length. This is a new section right now. They will tackle this, and this, I think, is a very difficult and muddy section. Well, let's have a look how they do ride it here now. They're just hitting it and riding on Rafael Schwede here, giving it his best legs as he hits it full speed. This man's had one very good performance in his life, second in a World Cup race. Other than that, he's just a very solid bike rider, but he is a strong bike rider, and Team Coast are looking for a place as a wild card into the Tour de France. You see the cobblestones here? You can't really see them at all, can you? Because they're strewn with mud just now. Here's Schwede. German rider from Nuremberg and Kasani, or it might be Max van Heeswijk there, and this is Ed Eriksson. All See, they're all riding their own private race down there, Paul, aren't they? Well, there's van Heeswijk going through right yeah, now. There's van Tristan Heeswijk. Hoffman. Nico Martin riding a little bit towards the rear, which is a bit of a surprise. You see the team car there just off to the left-hand side. Well, in this race, as in Tour of Flanders, very often the teams, Phil, will send cars forward to different sections of cobblestones to be in place just in case their bike rider has a mechanical problem. Because if you don't get a quick wheel change, as we have seen on one or two situations so far, then you're completely and utterly out of the bike race. They will che check and wait for the longest section of cobblestones and the cars will leapfrog forward throughout the day. 
Looking at the race then, we are not very far away. Those little hills in the back really are not hills at all, they're lumps of old coal slag. And that's the area we're in now, and very shortly we'll be seeing the famous uh, entrance to the pit head as we go past what is now a mining museum. And there's also some little pieces of artifacts there on Paris Roubaix as well, because the race always goes past as we enter the forest of Arenberg. It's a unique area of northern France, this. I thought there'd been a crash just there for a moment. There were a whole load of spectators cutting across the diagonal of the road there to see the bike race on two occasions. Schweder wasn't worried about that at all. He's just setting his own private tempo on the front. And this is the best way to ride the cobblestones because are you or the person dictating the pace which is comfortable to yourself? And this pace doesn't seem to be too comfortable for one or two other riders in this leading breakaway. Kasani just surviving there. You see how he's riding down the middle of the road. Schweder looks over his shoulder to see what sort of damage he's doing right now and he realises that the next section of cobblestones out on the road is going to be the very important forest of Arenberg. But they're recovering slowly and starting to claw their way back to this man. You can see in the distance there, the car headlights are still on, indicating low cloud and rain off the well, largely spray at the minute off the wheel of the bike riders in front. But yes, these riders now are trying to survive into the forest, then they'll reassess what their advantage is. At the minute, it's four minutes and eight seconds. That's the gap over the chase of what is left of the big peloton. And I think that's a nice, healthy lead to have as they approach the forest. Once they come off this section of cobblestones, they will he then head around the town of Valenciennes. And from Valenciennes... Oh, oh, oh. there's a problem there! I don't know how that, he unbelievably he well. he stayed upright, that was incredible. I think our cameraman there must have had a heart rate of about 250 for a moment there. That was Seb Sebastian Talabardon of the French team, he did well there. Yeah, I bet he uh, was felt a bit shocked, watch this, he has to wrench his foot off that pedal quickly because I was telling you earlier about the lip of the cobblestones on the mud and if you get stuck in that mud and try to get your bike back on the cobbles then you are lucky if you don't crash and he would have gone down absolutely beneath the wheels of our camera motorbike so uh, Sebastian can breathe again happily so. This is now the pace being forced by the very strong German here, Raphael Schweder, and the immensely strong Italian rider too, Enrico Cassani. They are really forcing the issue here for the others to follow. Well, Cassani doing a great job. He's actually having a brilliant season of these classics. He rode very well last week in the Tour of Flanders. But right now, I think much more a defensive role for him, though, Phil. He's thinking much more of Johan Museo in the back, surveys Carnarvon if he's recovered. And, of course, Freddy Rodriguez, who is riding very well at the moment for the Domo Farm Fritz team. I think Freddy will be given his chance today of possibly riding for himself. I reckon you're right, because Freddy is doing very, very good. As we get up to continue on this two and a half kilometer stretch now at uh, Havelui, zone pave number 16. 16 pave stretches, including this one, are still to go. And still, Schweder has had a very good spell this last five or ten minutes or so, leading the race. And Enrico Cassani, adrenaline still running from his puncture, is right up there with them as well. But you can see how these stretches have now spread eagle this breakaway. A little bit of a chance to recover, regroup here, because the next stop are going to be in the forest. Well, it's going to be a long and difficult section right now. These two leaders, I think, will look over their shoulders and realise they haven't done the damage they wanted to, and they will wait. That would be the most sensible tactic right now, to wait for the other 12 riders to come back onto their tail, because we have a long section of around about 8 or 9 kilometres before we charge into the forest of Arenberg. So there we are. Cassani looks over his shoulder. Schweder takes a well-earned rest, because all that effort hasn't done a lot of damage to the breakaway, as they sort of reformed now. And still we can see at the back there, having a little chat with the Domo Farm Fleet's manager to see what the situation is behind. This is the rider who almost uh, fell, having to regroup here, Talabarden from the Big Mat team. He's slowly getting back in. He'll get back safely on this occasion, but he's going to have to go through it all again once he gets to the rather severe cobbles in the forest where the usual big crowd awaits. But they barrier them off there now. They don't close in on the road like they used to in the years gone by. Well, he's having a hard ride to get onto the back end. He's using a monster gear right now to try and get himself up there. I don't think he'll have any trouble at all, Phil, because that front group of what is 13 riders right now are not really hammering. They're waiting for the big scenario to come, and that scenario is going to be the Forest of Arenberg, and that's when the race really does start to get really good fun. So the field are regrouping as we head up towards the Forest of Arenberg.
these guys here feel certainly have a huge advantage right now because in fact we are heading up to Wallace Arenberg and they will be the first riders to go in there and in the main field it will be absolute chaos when they charge into the forest of Arenberg because all of the main leaders and all of the big favorites before the start of the day are in that group behind which is currently around about four minutes in arrears now this is the sector 16 here that uh, have and this is the main field who are now crossing in pursuit of those 14 breakaways. We did have a couple of telecom riders in that breakaway, but gone now is the sprinter, Danilo Hondo. He was dropped and uh, leaving only Andreas Clear up there. There's the latest gap coming to us now. Four minutes and seven seconds. As far as we know, Paul, none of the favourites have missed this big split in the peloton. Museo's here, Fred Rodriguez, Eric Zabel, they're all still there, and of course George Hincapi. All of the big names are in the main peloton right now, but nearly all of those big names you mentioned, Phil, have had mechanical incidents out on the course. As you said, Freddy Rodriguez, two flat tyres for him. There's another problem at the back here. Looked like one of the Faso Bortolo riders having a problem. Rodriguez with two flat tyres, Museo already with one flat tyre. Just a few moments ago, we saw Eric Zabel just getting back onto the tail end of the main field. This, for the 100th anniversary of Paris-Roubaix, is certainly going to be a very dramatic one. Well, it's going to be quite a slippery old passage through the forest of Arenberg very shortly. We're now seeing US Postal. Uh, Paul is very concerned that the Postal team are working a little bit too hard here to keep Hincapi in touch, and they're doing Museo a favour, we feel. I think they are doing Museo a big favour right now. They've done an awful lot of the work to try and make sure that the advantage doesn't exceed the five or six minutes mark as we rejoin the rear end of the field. You can see just how slippery these cobblestones are today. It's because the rain has come down after about 10 days of unbelievably warm weather in the north of France. Not very normal for this time of the year, but the temperatures have dropped down. It's only just above freezing for the moment, and this first coat of rain in 10 days is making the cobbles very dangerous. It's true, you know, psychologically, I think this will hit many of the riders in this race simply because they weren't expecting this after 10 days of glorious sun, uh, especially for Gent Wevelgum and the Tour de Flanders and their training round here. And it seemed it was going to be set fair all of the way to Roubaix. And then just as the riders rolled out of Roubaix, back came the telephone message to say it was raining at the finishing line, which we could hardly believe. Well, as we drove to the finishing line, the weather changed dramatically. The cloud came in, rain began to fall quite heavily, and that's the way it's staying at the moment. The only good news for the riders just now is the rain has stopped in the velodrome at Roubaix, which is where we're commentating to you from. And it looks to me as though this breakaway is going to uh, split up here. We're looking at David Klinger. He's coming off the back of the peloton just now. He's done a lot of work at the front. He's now just trying to hang on to get off these cobblestones. And with a bit of luck, he might hook up on the back again. Well, very often what happens in the cobblestone sections, Phil, is they go absolutely ballistic. They blow out as many riders as possible, then they try and recover a little bit on the smooth surface. We're now back with the leading group of riders, and for them, they are getting themselves now psychologically prepared for what will come in around about four or five kilometers time, the big forest of Arenberg. On the front here, this is Bodrogi, the Mape rider just behind him. You can see the rider from Team Coach Schweber. But these guys right now, they're trying to get themselves ready for what is going to be the big explosion in this group. Because the forest of Arenberg, having been dry for so long, is going to be unbelievable when these guys come in there. Well, Mape looked to be very strong earlier on, and it was Robbie Hunter who was driving this breakaway. Then two punctures in fairly quick succession has taken him out of this leading group. Also his teammate, uh, Pedro Jarillo. So at the situation at the moment, as we are now on the leaving uh, Sector 16, that was the sector of Pave de Havloui, heading now towards the forest of Arenberg. So the riders inside 100 kilometers from the end, and a quick resume of the men we have in the breakaway. Enrico Cassani and Max van Heeswijk of Domo. Latslo Bedroga, the, the only Bedroga, the only survivor of the Mape team, is still there. Nico Matan of Kofidis, Tilly Gouvenu, Sebastian Talabarden, and uh, Alexis Sivakov, all of Big Matt. Thomas Eriksson of CSC, clear of the telecom. Yannick Tomback is still here. Hoffman of CSC, uh, Schweder of Team Coast, the Lotter rider is Hans uh, de Klerk, and Tom Boonen of US Postal. They are the survivors of 31 riders that broke away after 31 kilometers. We are now inside 100 to go, and for anybody that knows the route around Roubaix, and Paul Sherwin certainly does, when you see the mines here, Paul, you know the forest isn't far away. 
Well, that sign there indicating Paris Bay. All of the bike riders around here know that the race is about to come in to the Forest of Arenberg. The Forest of Arenberg over the last few years has been a place where the race not has been won, but almost certainly for a lot of riders, their ch chances have disappeared from winning Paris-Roubaix. They will be entering here in a few moments' time and all will be very nervous. So there we are, the breakaway. The next big challenge will be the Forest of Arenberg and we'll be there to see that. Well, this group, Paul, is a little bit headless at the moment, really, apart from Big Matt, must be thinking Christmas has arrived with three riders up here. Big Matt did a very good move. They had four men in the original breakaway of 31 that got clear after 31 kilometres of racing. These guys now know they've got a very good chance of surviving for a long time, but they are trying to recuperate just a little bit before they go into the forest. The Big Matt team, led here by Thierry Gouverneur, have got three riders left in this leading group of 14. But I think the biggest operation has got to have come really from the Domo Farm Fritz team, because they're the man we're looking at in the blue jersey at the back there, Max van Hazewijk. He's the kind of rider that you dare not give too much of an advantage to. Well, setting the pace there is Tom Back. He's the champion of Estonia. And these boys are working very hard to try and see the forest well clear the peloton, which they should succeed in doing now. Just over four minutes is the gap. And Max van Heeswijk up here has worked very hard because he's the big danger man, I think, uh, for Domo. And the Museo is taking full profit by riding in the slipstream of the American team, knowing they must chase because van Heeswijk has to be remembered, could win this race given the right chances. Only uh, about four days ago when I was speaking to him at the, uh, before the Tour of Flanders and Gent again, he was saying he has tremendous form this year, but he's had so much bad luck, either punctures or crashes, but at the moment, things are going his way. Well, they're on to the Forest of Arenberg, the leading group, and that looks like Enrico Cassani, who's gone in there in first position at the moment. Domo Farm Fritz riding a very sensible and clever race, Phil, because they have got two good riders in the leading group, and Johan Museo sitting at the back. And on to the Forest of Arlenberg now. It's Van Heeswijk setting the pace here. I think it is. It might be Cassani. Well, actually, it is Cassani. He's wearing number two on his back. Now, looking down on the rest of the group right now, they are just hoping to survive on this very difficult section of cobblestones. We are hearing, in fact, that the main field is absolutely charging down towards this leading group. There's Tom Boonen there in fourth position on the road, a great ride by him. Max van Heeswijk there is in fifth place for the moment. This group has not splintered as much as I thought it was going to. Well, we're now into the Forest of Arenberg. They've just entered here, and it's Max van Heeswijk driving on at the front at the moment. The Belgian flags are waving. There's a huge crowd here, and it looks as though uh, down in the centre of the course with 94 kilometres to go, Paul, the rain has eased off. That is actually is Enrico Cassani, Cassani yes. who's gone into the Forest of Arenberg, but you can just see there's a little bit of slime come in from the amount of rain. It's actually not raining out on the course, unfortunately here at the velodrome it isn't raining right now either, but it has made the course very slippery indeed. When the main field comes in here, there's going to be absolute chaos, as there always is at the Forest of Arenberg. Cassani flicking across the road there, trying to get himself onto the smoother part at the side there, for him, fortunately, the organization have put these steel barriers down, which has allowed the riders to come into the for Forest of Arenberg in a fairly normal situation. In previous years, this race has been absolutely invaded here by the crowd. I think it's taken a certain amount of the atmosphere away for the spectators, but for the riders at least, and as a former rider, I have to go on that side, it has made it a much safer section of cobbles. Well, that is absolutely true. You may notice the police uh, outriders here all riding motocross bikes and not their normal road racing, uh, road bikes rather, and for good reason too. Cassani, he's got great form just now. He had a wonderful Tour de Flanders as well, and he's pushing on here for Domo. And at the back of this breakaway now is the Big Mac boys who are getting themselves just in a little bit of bother as we speak. That's big Tilly Gouverneur, I think, at the front now. No, it's Hans de Klerk at the front now for Lotto, just behind uh, Cassani. Schweder is the rider in the yellow. This is a very interesting group. 
In third place there is Tom Boonen. What a great revelation he's been to us over this last three weeks. He used to be a young man who was looked after by Dirk Demol, the team manager of the U.S. Postal Service and a former winner of Paris-Roubaix. And look at him ride on these cobblestones here, Phil. You can see just how comfortable and confident that young man is. They were telling me this morning that after this race is finished, they're actually going to rest him for a month and try and bring him back onto form later on in the season. And it's good when you get a brilliant talent like that not to burn a rider out, especially when you don't forget that this young man is just 21 years of age. Absolutely. He won 11 races in his last year as an amateur, and he was the under-23 champion of Belgium. I said to the team manager, Johan Brule, this morning, you found a great one in Tom Boone, and Johan, he says, oh, we knew that three years ago. <laughs> Pretty confident. It's easy to say that once the man has got one or two very good performances under his belt and I think he has been a great ally for George Hincapi over this last week of racing still in the forest of Arenberg this is a hugely long section of cobblestones and it's still Enrico Cassani on the front there just to the right hand side behind the, the race organizers car setting a fairly good tempo but Boonen using all of his experience riding down the middle of the cobblestones the little piece of road at the side there can be very dangerous indeed because every now and again very occasionally you can get a long line of cobblestones which can force the front wheel to just disappear but this leading group now of 14 riders splitting into four men who are moving off the front it doesn't appear as if anyone has had any bad luck or any flat tires or mechanicals at the moment 2.4 kilometers along of this cobble stretch a little rise coming now as they come towards the end of it and it's Cassani taking out uh, over the top there de Klerk Boonen and Ralph Schweder they are the four riders just a slight advantage for them Trying to close down the gap, though, as the, as the race now tries to uh, reduce the lead of those four. So often, although we're still a long way from the finish, this is where the foundations are built uh, for the riders who take out the major prizes. These are the big map boys placed in a little bit of trouble. That's Yannick Tombak in the blue jersey as champion uh, of his country. And he is going to be joined at the back, too, I think, by other riders now. You can see them being shaken as they try to pick what is a comparatively smooth ride over these cobbles. The Italian flag there, Paul, well, they've been the champions of the Classic so far this season, but there's very few of them uh, near the sharp end of the race today yet. Well, this has been a very long section of cobblestones, and very shortly at the far end of this section of cobblestones, Phil, we will have the Whoa, main field clash. charging in, and the main field is in the forest of Arenberg right now. Somebody slipped right across the road, and once you lose your momentum here, Phil, it is devastation. There is Maximilian Chianri right in the middle of the group there. We can glance a little bit further back to see who else is present in this leading group. There's the champion of Belgium, Ludovic Capella. The champion of Holland has just gone down there, Jans Quartz as well. But it's absolute chaos here in the forest of Arenberg, and we are not surprised. We are not surprised at all. They are really struggling. This is a Rubens Bertogliati who's battling at the back. He was in the breakaway earlier of the original 31 fastest man from the main group into this co this cobblestone section now is Stefan Weissemann there on the right hand side Georgie Hincapi is there as well in second place so he's got a good entrance into the forest of Arenberg just trying to ride across behind there's one of the Domo riders I don't think it is Johan Museo because Museo is a little bit further down the line right now but Hincapi as he was last year very close to the front coming into the forest of Arenberg and the main field there stretching out behind there's another mechanical incident for one of these guys in the main group this is decision time the first big decision for the peloton this is why US Postal rode so hard to bring George to the forest in a great position to try and bridge gaps surveys Canavan in the center of the picture there Fred Rodriguez off to the right battling Fred he's had two flat tires today and he's ridden hard already to get himself in what is an excellent position this is an amazing bike race and you'll never see anything else like it in the world of sport and it looks as though the big guns are firing at the front of that peloton they all knew what they were waiting for this is a very strategic piece of cobblestones there's Freddy Rodriguez now leading the front end of that small split there Carnarvon is in this group as well but I think Georgie Hincapi is going to be very happy with his performance coming into the forest of Arenberg. There's the Italian champion as well in the tricolore there, Daniele Nardello. He is also riding fairly close to the front right now. But Vesemann is the man setting the tempo. There's Taffy coming through. So all the big names for the moment, Phil, are in the main peloton. Yes, but they'd like to see the gap come down a little bit. It's still four minutes, the last uh, time check we've got. George Hincapi there, second wheel as they come through the forest. 
A lot of hard work having to be done. That looks very much like it is Johan Museo who's got himself right on the wheel of George Hincapi. Remember, bad memories for Museo in this direction of the forest. This is where he badly damaged his knee that almost ended his career. But they are memories, thank heavens now. And this man is still uh, belies his mid-30s age bracket. As they leave the forest of Arenberg, there's some big hitters now, got themselves a lead over the main field. It's amazing because I have to say that did not look like Johan Museo at all. He pulled his sunglasses right down in front because he wanted to keep himself as much alert as possible. He's now come out of the forest of Arenberg with George Hincapie. So that really is, I think, going to set up a very serious chasing group right now. Well, this is an amazing race. Everybody seems to be so committed so early on today. The field is disintegrating. The gap has come down slightly. They've got it back about 20 seconds during the crossing of the forest. 3.40. There's Andrea Taffy. He, too, has been off the back with flat tyres today. He's off the back a little bit now in the split, and he's got some work ahead of him to get back up. Well, the race now swinging off the cobblestones of the forest of Arenberg. Now we return down towards Wallers, then we swing right, and we continue on these cobblestones, which come thick and fast as we approach the finish, of course. But the Paris-Bay race very much on, but it still has an awful long way to go, this race, and George Hincapie now has started to fight well so we're looking down Paul at the leading group here as they try this will be the chase group what are you, 10 riders down there yeah they're going into the next section of cobblestones and this is a very difficult section too quite a long section is the cobblestones of Wales and they're around about two and a half kilometers in length as well this is a section of cobblestones that was used in years gone by at the Grand Prix of Denain and they can be quite treacherous because they go through a lot of farm fields right now they go through a, a small former railway bridge as well which has been nicknamed in recent years the Pont Gibus after the great Gilbert Ducla La Salle the man who won Paris-Roubaix on two occasions these guys as we look there at Laszlo Badrogi starting to get themselves back into a, a sense of organization right now because they know, Phil, that the race has now started very much in earnest behind them. And the guys from Domo will know as they enter these cobblestones that Johan Museo has left the front end of the main field with Georgie Hincapie. Yes, and Tom Boonen there now taking up his role of the ticket collector on the back of this breakaway of 10. But what a sensation he has been uh, this past 10 days. First time that Paul and I have seen him in action, and he had a wonderful Tour of Flanders. A terrific Gent Wavelgum, finally finishing in seventh place, and now he's right at the sharp end yet again here in his first Paris-Roubaix. Domo numerically have two men up here, and looking as though they're both extremely strong in Enrico Cassani and Max van Heeswijk. And Bruno will just keep an eye on them and try not to work too hard now. The telecom rider who has bridged the gap is Andreas Kleyer. Nico Matan has made it. Hans de Klerk has also come across. The team coast rider, he's not in our picture just yet, but that's Ralph Schiveda and Thomas Eriksson of CSC. One or two of the big mats have made the gap as well. Well, Big Mac made the big operation, but this is the move that everybody looks for, Phil, at the first part of Paris-Roubaix. The team managers the night before, when they have their team meeting, mentioned to all of the riders, you have to look out for the early morning breakaway. But I don't think anybody could have imagined that the early morning breakaway today was going to contain, th contain 31 riders who built up an advantage of more than four and a half minutes over the main field. We're now looking at Max van Hazewijk leading them over the forest, the, the, the cobblestones of Wallaise, and they've still got a fair way to go before they come onto the good section of road. Yes, and uh, they won't see too much good section of road till we get to the finish, which is still two and a half hours away at least, as the peloton gap at 3.15 and closing in quite quickly. And Sean should know because he won this race twice when the prize money shot up to something like $25,000 from two or 3,000. Sean was the man who took out Paddy Roubaix. We're looking now at the 10 men who have come together after the Forest of Arenberg. We're on sector 14 now, inside 88 kilometers to go. 
This is the second group on the road here right now. This is a group which really is starting to contain some serious names. Stefan Weissemann there. I asked him this morning, Phil, if he was going to enjoy the dry conditions because nobody could have <laughs> imagined that it was going to rain like it has done over the last couple of hours. He says, it makes no difference to me, dry or wet, it's still Paris-Roubaix. It's the race that I really feel I can win. But the man who wants to win is the man in first position right now there, Georgie Hincapi. He's in the place in Paris-Roubaix where he wants to be. There coming up as well, Lars Mikkelsen for Team Coast, but Johan Museo has also made this very serious junction. And looking down the road there, Phil, they have opened up a serious advantage over what was the main field when they came into the forest of Arenberg. Well, as you can see, they are now entering sector 14 here. The leaders have gone through this. This isn't too severe. This is the one that goes through the Pont Gibus. But it is a nice chance for them to try and pick up the pace here. This incredible bike rider, Johan Museo, again has had to rejoin after a puncture. He did it well. Two teammates waited for him. Now he knew he had to make his next decision in the forest. George knew that as well. And they've got some tough boys in this breakaway now. Not least, as Paula said, Stefan Wesserman. A very tough man from the former East Germany, and he really is a tough bike rider, and I think this is exactly his sort of race. It definitely is. If we remember last year, he had some serious problems with his cleat, and I asked him about that this morning. He said, everything is being cleared up, everything is organised, I've got no problems today, I shouldn't have any mechanicals at all, and he obviously hasn't has, because he's in that leading, that chasing group on the road with the big names like Johan Museo and Georgie Hincapi. A lot of people are talking about this being the last year of Johan Museo, and I actually asked him the question this morning, and I said, well, are you going to race next year? And he said, basically, Johan Museo likes to keep a few surprises up his sleeve, so maybe we'll see him again next year. Well, what does that mean? You never know with Johan. I think if he doesn't win today, he'll be back again for another dose next year, but we'll see. But this is the breakaway that is still clear. And that Janet Tombak is still in this breakaway. Enrico Cassani, Hans de Klerk, Ralf Schweda. Four minutes to the peloton now, but the second group uh, at 3.06, I think, is George Hincapi. We're looking at that now. Johan Museo deciding to take up control at the front end of this group. And he looks a bit strange there with his glasses just on the front end of his nose there. What he's doing there is to stop as much of the dirt coming up into his eyes as possible and just looking over the top of those sunglasses. This man is completely comfortable on these cobblestones. It's hard to believe that that was a corner on cobblestones he went round there because he did not slow down at all. And the, the men who are the best at these cobblestones have to be on absolutely superb form today. You can see how close Stefan Weissemann is riding to the back wheel of Johan Museo, and I can tell you having done this, it is a pretty dangerous thing to do because you're absolutely relying on the man in front of you. Yes, you are, and you've got to put 100% confidence that he's going to go the right way. Otherwise, you'll be in all sorts of trouble. We're looking now at the 12 leaders, which have regrouped after the crossing of the forest and also sector 14. We're about 84 kilometers from the finish, just over 50 miles still to race. An awful lot of room for change yet. Five kilometers to the next section of cobblestones as we look at the composition of that group in the front of the bike race. Kasani, Van Heiswijk, Bodrogi, Hans de Klerk, Nico Matin, Tombak, the champion of Estonia, Schweder, Eriksson, Hoffman, Tom Boonen, I have to say, absolutely superb for U.S. Postal Service. Team Telecom have got their man there, Andreas Clear. And Thierry Gouvenou, finally the last survivor of the Big Mat team, who initially had four riders in that leading group. You can see the clouds up there. The rain, uh, thankfully, has stopped at the moment as they break away here, now consolidating. This is George Hincapi. This is the chase group running it just over three minutes behind as we speak. And this is going to be a very difficult race. Anyway. Well, this is the leading group of riders there out on the course. Tom Boonen for US Postal there, moving up into first position. But right now, Phil, it's going to start to get quite tactical because a lot of these riders will be in communication with their team managers behind. They will know that the group containing George Hincapi and Johan Museo and Stefan Weissemann is starting to come through. So I would say those teams in the front will turn off the chase because if these men do reintegrate, then it's going to completely change the face of the front end of this main field. In that group in the middle, it was very good to see Robbie Hunter was in a good yeah. group of riders. He will get picked up by Johan Museo, and that will be then a very strong working group moving forward. But once again, like last year, the team that was always dominant in Paris-Roubaix, Team Mappé, don't seem to be having Lady Luck on their side. No, and uh, they were the teams for the classics until they split up, and Domo uh, went uh, from Belgium with Patrick Lefebvre, but look at this now. 
There's two minutes and a half is the gap now. There's still a lot of racing to be done here, and I think a lot of changes to be made before we get to the finish. Well, as we look now at this leading group, they most certainly now feel know that the race is starting to unfold behind them. A few extra tough cobblestone sections have been put into the latter part of this race. Paris-Roubaix over the last couple of years certainly has tried to keep its nature, the, the fact that this race uses around about 50 kilometers or 31 miles of cobblestones, but it's more and more important for the organization to go out and look for new cobblestone sections because as we get great progress in the transportation system around France, it really is amazing that the, or the route in the north of France manages to conserve an awful lot of cobblestone sections, and in fact many of them are protected monuments today. As we look at the main chase pack here, this is Thomas Eriksson in the breakaway, main leading pack rather, sorry, of the 12 men who brought themselves back together. I'll quickly give you their names again. Enrico Cassani, Max van Heeswijk, Lazio Bedrogi, Nico Martin, Thierry Gouvenou, Sebastian Talabardon, Hans de Klerk, Raphael Schweder, Tristan Hoffman, Yannick Tombak, Andreas Kleier, and uh, in fact, uh, the only US postal man here sitting right at the back at the minute is Tom Boone. And the other man I didn't mention, Thomas Erickson of CSC. He's the white jersey, about four men along the bottom of the line. We're now on to zone 13 of the Pov Pave here. Now we're waiting for the latest update on the chase being enacted by Stefan Wesserman, Lars Mikkelsen, George Hinkapi, and Johan Museu. They've come up on the remnants of this breakaway already. And uh, I'm rather hoping that Robert Hunter, who's had such bad luck today, has got the legs to get onto that train and come forward again with them. It's a very long section of cobblestones, this too, Phil, because it's actually split up into two sections. You ride along this part of the cobblestones here, and you think that's the end. Well, when you get to the, the end of all this little zigzag section we're looking down upon here, then all of a sudden you turn to the right, and there's another long stretch of cobblestones, which is around about 1.5 kilometers in length, and this is what they look like. The important thing is to have the form on a day like this because if you have good form and the legs are powerful, you absolutely glide over the surface of these cobblestones as we look now at Laszlo Bodrogi. He will now be told the confirmation of exactly what's happening in the race behind. He'll know that his teammate Robbie Hunter has been picked out by Johan Museo and George Hincapi, but he will also know that Andrea Taffy, a former winner of this race, is somewhat behind and trying to keep himself in contact. Taffy also one of the riders in the early part of the stage, Phil, having a few little difficulties with his mechanics. Yes, Taffy actually looks as though he's done a complete Paris-Roubaix at the moment, Paul, uh, because he spent so much time battling the cobblestones from the rear of the peloton with his flat tyre. And uh, he's still a very determined bike rider, and he knows uh, both sides of the Queen of the Classics because he's also won this event. So they're around about 50 miles now, almost exactly uh, to the finish as they are continuing now onto the sector of the Pave on zone 13. And this uh, is the debut. We've done the debut through Hanang and we're on to Wandinyi. And it'll take us through to 80 kilometers on the finish as we make our way. And we're running exactly on schedule at the moment. If anything, we are slightly ahead of schedule because of the very fast start. And that is a good sign that the race is very much under pressure. It's taking a long time, I think, for the leaders, the men we expect to be at the front of the race very shortly, to try and put matters to rights, purely because they allowed 31 men to escape in the first 30 kilometers of racing, and that was when the sun was shining. It was when the sun was shining. It's all changed right now. It's very cold here in the north of France. Just tickling above freezing level at the moment. The rain is sort of inconsistent right now, but it's just enough, Phil, to make the cobblestones very dangerous and slippery. You can see just a small coating of moisture over the surface. There's old cobblestones there. As we can see on the front, the Domo Farm Fritz there, rider is Max van Hezewijk. About five or six places back there is his teammate Enrico Cassani, and just sitting on the back there for US Postal Service is Tom Boonen. Boonen has done an absolutely magic ride, and I don't think he could have had a better week in the one-day classics for the start of his, his professional career. Well, 2.16 now, and that's the Hincapi group, and they're coming in as fast as they can, but not too quick. 
to try and pick up the lead as we've no further news at the moment on the peloton remember we are actually situated in the velodrome at the finish where well, i have to tell you now the rain has just started again here so uh, i thought it was going to clear up but it hasn't been the case as the riders now are making the way towards uh, sector 12 which will take us into the last 75 kilometers. This is the composition of the chase group now. Harillo and Hunter were in the lead group as well as Serpolini. They're now back in a very select chase group here containing George Hincapi. Dennis Zanetta, he was originally in the breakaway. He's gone back as well. And Stefan, and there's a, bell, a little bit of a wheel slip there. And that looks to me as though it was Andrea Taffy on the front who lost his back wheel. But what a bike rider. I think he held it up. That was pretty tricky doing that, but you know, these guys, when they're in good form, they are absolute acrobats on the bike. You're alert every time you come into the cobblestone sections and you're waiting for something like that. But this is turning out to be pretty dramatic. A very good move by Hinkapi. He followed the acceleration of Stefan Weissemann through the forest of Arenberg, and we're now looking at a nucleus of the big names of this bike race. One man missing at the moment, Peter van Pettigem from the Lotto squad, but this would be fantastic to see Hinkapi ride across the gap right now it's a fairly large group because they've picked up one or two riders who are in the early morning breakaway but Hinkapi is riding like a man possessed he actually wants to put a stranglehold on this bike race but he needs to be very careful of the performance of Johan Museo because Museo is an older rider and he really has got a great tactical sense and he'll use Hinkapi to the very last moment but the one thing that Paul that might be in George's favor now is he's got rid of all the teammates basically of Museo and that we might see a, a more a one-on-one -on -one race today than sort of three versus George. Well, that's what it was like in the past. It was very difficult for George when he had to come up against the full block of the Domo Farm Freaks team. This looks now like the shape of Maximilian Chianri, who he said this morning that he wanted to ride well, and maybe today was going to be the day. He said, I don't want to say like I do every year the same old thing, but I really hope that one day I'm going to have the luck in Paris-Roubaix because it certainly is a race I'd like to win. And there, just tucked in behind him, is the man that we really didn't think would see the start line today, Cervés Carnarvon. He, in fact, had a very interesting accident out on the course as he was training last year, that last week, and he got... He actually had a, a collision with a school kid on a bike. He was taken to hospital. He had x-rays, and they decided to allow him to ride. The team said he could ride today, Phil, because the weather conditions were great. Well, hats off to uh, Cervais, because he's still in the race, and weather conditions are far from great right now. We caught a glimpse there of Nico Matan. This is the leading group in uh, the Paru Bay, the 100th edition of this race. Matan trying to get clear at the minute, taking with him what looks like Tiri Gouvenou. Uh, just ahead of the original, or the remnants now of the breakaway, 12 of them still left together as they drive on towards the finish in Roubaix. But it's still a long way to go yet, and they know it. Hans de Klerk is the man who's joined onto the back wheel here of Nico Matin. And these conditions, I don't think anybody could have imagined it was going to be like this this morning, Phil, because from the three days of La Panne through the Tour of Flanders and Ghent Wavel game, the skies have been blue here in the north of France, and right now they're a very terrible grey with a consistent small amount of rain coming down. It's not enough to wash the cobblestones of the mud, which makes them very slippery. It's just enough to put a small coating of moisture over the surface, which is why these guys are slipping all over the road right now. And gently does it, uh, even on the smooth roads. Matan are bringing round Hans de Klerk, the two riders with Belgium very close to their hearts, and these are their types of road here as they race towards the borders with Belgium. And this is the chase group, some eight riders, it looks like. Paul are tagging on. And uh, just the two, and then there's one in, to, in between there, and then two, four, six riders are chasing there. So the breakaway again has uh, split up a little bit here. Ralph Schweda is there. Best uh, place for him was a second place in a World Cup Classic. This is the second group on the road right now. That's uh, Lars Mikkelsen on the front in the yellow jersey. Following him, Johan Museo, then Georgi Hincapi, Stefan Weissemann is there as well. And this is the kind of speed that the big names push themselves to over the cobblestones. They are hitting these cobblestone sections right now at speeds approaching 50 kilometers an hour. And it really now is becoming a war of attrition on these cobblestones. It's a wearing down process, trying to knock the living daylights out of your adversaries as we go on to the very tough sections, recuperate a little bit on the smooth roads, and then go for it once again. Well, this uh, also a little bit wet here. The rain and just hanging off at the minute. 
Uh, but I don't think it's going to stay that way now. There's all, every sign is going to continue again uh, as the riders make their way towards the finish. Heading on to sector 12 here now. There the leaders steadily regrouping as they are driven on. This is in fact the chase group we're looking at now. This certainly is turning out to be one of the world-class bike races, Paris-Roubaix today. One we'll all remember, the 100th running. These two riders getting away on the cobbles. Nico Matan here always promises to do something great, and he's being trailed at the minute by Hans de Klerk of Lotto. It reminds me, Phil, how important it is when you're a bike rider to be prepared for absolutely everything. Most of the guys this morning will have come to the start with fairly short sleeves and ready for a, a nice sunny ride in the Paris-Roubaix, the 100th edition of this bike race. But all of them will have had with them a special bag that they leave in the team manager's car, which would have in it clothing for the Arctic conditions that they're now being subjected to. And many of them out on the course today have had the ability to put on extra coats, extra arm warmers, and obviously, as we caught a glimpse there of Nico Martin, a very warm hat over his head to keep a, as much of this cold out as possible. Well, Nico finished uh, well in this race last year. 13th, in fact, unlucky for some, but he's a battler and he knows this course and enjoys the Paris-Roubaix a lot. Got himself five good wins last year, including the prologue of the Paris-Nice. So he's a well-experienced bike rider with Hans de Klerk in this breakaway. And the rain has started to come down very, very heavily now. And uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you that your commentators are working in the open air today, so uh, all our facts and figures are in our heads rather than written down. <laughs> well, they're pretty good heads as well, Phil, because this kind of racing and these kind of circumstances are ones that we always remember. These are the dramatic races of the start of the year. Those are the two leaders up there, Matin and Hans de Klerk, a small group coming behind. But last time we looked back at the chase group of Hincap in Museo, they didn't seem to be very much more than just a couple of minutes behind this leading group of riders. Quite shortly, they'll be coming up to another set of cobblestones, and that will be the section of cobblestones at tilois les marchiens and then they will have a long section of flat, smooth road to recuperate. But what's happening at the moment is that a big chase coming back with Museo and George Hincapi. Yanis Tombak, these are the two leaders. Sorry, this is Nico Matan. And there we are, Paul. There are 12 zones remaining. A total is 20.8 kilometers, just a, a shade under 50 kilometers in total of Pave of the 261 kilometers of Paddy Roubaix. And these two boys decided to strike out rather early, I feel, but you take your chance when it presents itself in Paris Roubaix. The important thing in Paris Roubaix is to try and see just what the opposition is like on the cobblestone sections. And if these guys are strong in the group with you, then if you do leave them behind on the cobbles, then they can ride back up on the smoother tarmac and then try and form a smaller group at the front. This group started the day off at 31 riders in strength, and it's now literally exploded since we came in to the big forest of Arenberg. But I think the most important news so far is the fact that George Hincapi and Johan Museo and Stefan Weissman are chasing behind. This is the section of cobblestones at Tilois-les-Marchiens, and it's called Warlang. It's 2.4 kilometers in length. It's a four-star section of cobblestones, and you can see the experience of those Belgians picking their way across there as we go a little further back down the race to see just what the situation is like, and this is at the back of the race. Andrea Taffy seems to be having quite a tough time. He's there with his teammate, Daniele Nardello, and so it seems as if in the early part of this race, once again, it doesn't look as if Lady Luck has smiled upon the shoulders of Andrea Taffy. No, and he's got Gabriella Balducci is the rider just in our camera lens here, nearest camera. And there's a little bit of work to be done now for Daniela Nardello. Domo have got a few riders here as well. Number five there is Marco Malesi, and number three is Wilfred Kretzkins, who was a very good, strong rider the other day and has had a very good week, so he's a strong man to help them possibly regroup. But you never know when Lady Luck is going to turn against you. Zabinia Spruck was number 27 there. The Rabobank riders here working very hard. Eric Zabel also in this breakaway. And so this is the group now trying to get back on terms and reach up with George Hincapi, I feel. And there's the two leaders now. Hans de Klerk, Nico Matan.
Looking very solid on the front for the moment at least. So we're looking now at the two riders in the lead here, and this is Hans de Klerk and Nico Matan. We have gone on to the first of two sectors of cobbles at Pave Sector 12A, and they haven't got a big lead over the group, but in fact, uh, the group trying to bring them back. Uh, Andrea Taffy's got himself into a chase group to try and reach up with George Hincapie, and Eric Zabel is with Taffy but they're leaving themselves an awful lot of work to do now to bridge the gap. This race is still spread out across the cobblestones over about five minutes. It's going to be a tough one to know exactly when you are at the front today as we continue towards the blue skies. Well, you can see by the dirt on the camera lens here, the old cobbles are throwing up the mud at us. These are the two leaders. And Nico Matan, they're sharing the pace here very well. They're not panicking at this stage. They've got the gap, uh, but of course they know only too well it is still a long way to the finish. Uh, something like 71 kilometres still to ride, Paul. Hard to believe that these weather conditions have changed so much, but it is going to turn out to be a pretty dramatic Paris-Roubaix. Those two leaders don't have much of an advantage over what remains of the group there, and it looks, in fact, as if the young Belgian rider from US Postal has disappeared from that group. He was riding so well, Tom Boonen. But no, there he there. is. He's oh, there. it's good to see him. He was just caught in the shadow there, right on the tail there of Tristan Hoffman. Yes, well, we're looking now at uh, the chase group. They're giving them at 10 seconds on the two front runners, And the third group will be that of George Hincapie. And, of course, Johan Museu at two minutes and one second. They're coming back to the leaders, but they're doing it very slowly. And I think that's the way to do it right now. No point in uh, committing suicide to reach them too soon. And it looks as though Nico Matan's having a job hanging on to Hans de Klerk here on this sector of cobbles as well. Hans de Klerk looking very comfortable, but you go through different patches on a race like this. Let's not forget it's 264 kilometers of racing, but this is the intense part of the racing. Once we get into the cobblestone sections here, it is so repetitive. The form is up and down all of the time. You really have to try and make sure that you control yourself and save just a little bit till the end. Now then, we're looking at the, the serious chase group, I would have to call this one. This is the group here with Hincapi, Museo, Lars Mikkelsen is in there. These two riders here were in the leading group a little bit earlier on in the day. It looks like Thierry Marechal is in there with Art Vierhouten. But I haven't seen anything so far, Phil, of Peter van Pettigem. Well, they've still got a long way to go, but I think they will join the front runners very shortly. Well, Bernard Eno once rode this race, won it, and then told the organizers he'd never take part in it again. But happy 100th to everybody, and that's the way we all feel. We're still on the Sector 12 second section now as we head uh, towards the finish, some 70 kilometers still to ride. They're trying to regroup at the front, but the pace is still being set uh, by Hans de Klerk and Nico Matan. Tom Boonen, the US Postal Sensation, is in that group. This is the second group right now. This looks like Johan Museo on the front. He really wants to put the hammer down. He wants to get Paris-Roubaix on in earnest. He wants to get himself into a position where he can possibly win this bike race again. But now taking over the pacemaking on this very long section of cobblestones at Wild Lang. It's 2.4 kilometers long. That's 1.8 miles. Hincapi has come to the front and he is setting an unbelievable tempo. He doesn't have very many teammates left now. They've all been left behind. They did a lot of work for George Hincapi. They literally blew the race apart and Hincapi now is putting a man like Johan Museo into difficulty. Well, it's becoming something of a balancing act here on the cobblestones. Museo, the master of the cobbles, looks the least troubled. George is riding very solidly as well. There we are, just inside 70 kilometers now to the finish. And these riders uh, know they're riding behind the two race favorites here, George Hincapi and Johan Museo. So why not let them do all of the work? That seems to be the attitude here on sector 12 of the pave. George is doing a lot of work, but he, I think George is happier when he is doing a lot of work in Paris-Roubaix. He's shown us that over the years with his sixth place and his two fourth places. He likes to dictate, and this is one of those unusual races, Paul, where I think you have to be uh, proving to yourself all of the time you're strong. And of course, being first man, you're getting first shot at the cobbles as well. 
The strange thing about riding the cobblestone sections, we just ride off section number 12 to go here, is that it hurts everybody just exactly the same way. And Georgie Hincapie is dictating his pace to the other riders in the group. And yes, it does give you an awful lot of confidence to know that you're putting other people into difficulty. But it is also, I think, what has happened so far in the race is George Hincapie has made a very good operation. He's isolated Johan Museo, so it's going to be at the end of the day, Museo against Hincapie, but don't count out Stefan Weissemann. The big thing that US Postal have done was they used their team to perfection making sure that that leading group of 31 didn't get too far off the front, but they did have a man in the group, the man that they expected to ride well, the man who in the Belgian papers this week said, I am going to be the sergeant for George Hincapie this weekend in Paris-Roubaix. Well, I think he's had a bit of promotion there because he's probably <laughs> moved up to Lieutenant Colonel. I think, you know, we're going to see a lot from that boy over the years, and, and he's learning it uh, with a great team too because they're having a wonderful start to the year, US Postal. Fifth place by Floyd Landis in the Circuit of the South in France. Just 48 hours before this race began. The gap now, as you saw, two minutes and three seconds. So it's being held just now by this uh, counter-attack by Hans de Klerk and Nico Matan. De Klerk is a good man on rough roads because last year he won one of the Belgian semi-classics, Kuhn of Lussels Kuhn, and that also has cobble stretches of roads in it. There's Robbie Hunter sat at the back. He knows all about the bad luck today. Two flat tyres took him out the front and put him in this group here. Freddy Rodriguez has got into this group as well. I'm not sure where Freddy Rodriguez came from, but he has managed to integrate the group. And I'm trying to look a little bit further forward to see if this is still the group containing Hincapie and Johan Museo. And it must be because right yep. on the front there, there's a US Postal jersey. So Johan Museo has got a very serious teammate who's come up alongside him right now. The man who at the start of this day was third overall in the World Cup, the American champion, Freddy Rodriguez. And he too, Phil, has had a brilliant start to the season. The best he's ever had no doubt about that second in Milan San Remo that gave him all of the confidence he required uh, to have a very good Tour de Flanders finishing in the chase group and look at this trouble for Hans de Klerk now as he's on this sector of cobblestones Matan is pushing on a little bit and he's well gonna and uh, oh, I thought that was another cyclist coming in the shop it was off uh, camera there's the shot just look at this now Paul this has gone from what was just dust covered just 24 hours ago to a little bit of a quagmire now Absolutely brilliant. These are the Paris Roubaix that certain riders absolutely dream about. I remember Steve Bauer always wanted the weather like this. A little bit of picture breakup, but that's because of the microwave link up there. De Klerk lost his momentum there, Phil. And once you lose your momentum, it Ouch. is so difficult to get going again. Well, he's being urged on by the crowd who are wisely staying the other side of that barrier. He is no longer a happy man. I'm wondering if, in fact, he's got a softening tyre here and he's in all sorts of bother now. And it's a good job we can't, we don't have sound out on the course, I think, just now. But Hans de Klerk, I thought perhaps he had the softening tyre, but he seems to be okay again now. He's found his place. Usually the cobbles are best to ride dead centre. That's when the highest above the ground and usually the least damaged by the traffic. As we look down on the two leaders, and in fact, de Klerk is going to ride back up onto the wheel of Nico Matan. It would be foolish of Nico to even try to stay away just now. He'll need a lot of help if he's going to hold them all off to Roubaix. We still have an awful long way to go to the finishing line right now, but I would say that you're right. Nico Matin has waited for De Klerk to come forward because he needs the assistance of somebody else with still almost 60 k's to go to the finish line. That's right, slightly more in fact, and the rain is very, very heavy at the finishing line at the moment, and we are getting quite wet ourselves as these two riders have got themselves back together. And oh, and down they go as we speak, and Fred Rodriguez has piled up as well. Well, this is the chaos of Paris-Roubaix. It looks as if Stefan Weissemann has got his bike caught in the front wheel of somebody else there, one of the, the riders from Lotto at the back here. Robbie Hunter was down as well. And I remember this section of cobblestones, Phil. It just needs a small amount of rain. This was dry before we came here just a few days ago. Hunter, you see, is having a hard time getting himself up and running again. These cobblestones are so slippery, you can hardly get yourself going once you stop. And for Robbie Hunter, you see, he, he gets it's no traction at all. Let's have a look at that one more time. Coming round there, the Lotto rider went down. Freddie tried to correct it. He couldn't do that at all. Weissemann is off the road into the potatoes. As coming through <laughs> oh, on the far hand me. side there, you can see Robbie Hunter is down, but certainly not out. Poor old Steph has got his handlebar stuck in the front wheel there, and he's having to sort that out. Robbie Hunter, two punctures in the fall that we know of right now. 
And meanwhile, the policeman himself has also dropped it here. Well, we, our sympathies are with him because it's nothing to do with riding skills at all. These are, this is a very treacherous stretch of cobblestones. Tilly Marichel is the lotter rider there. Well, you really have to be alert, Phil, coming back to this kind of sections of cobblestones. That looks like Lars Mikkelsen trying to get himself back in contention. That is Johan Museo who's taken advantage of that slippery section of cobblestones there to get the pet the tempo back up again Hincap is not letting anything get away from him right now he knows the man to watch is Johan Museo the Lion of Flanders and he probably has got one or two surprises up his sleeves for us well these are the cobblestones at the worst today at the worst because the rain hasn't been here for at least two or three weeks and now it's fallen today and it's made them very slip indeed this is Johan Museo now piling the pressure on at the front He's seen his chance and he's taking it and you can't blame him for that. We are now back with the leaders, Paul, and these are the two leaders, probably unaware about that big crash behind. Well, they're now on a very long, smooth section of road where they'll try and recuperate a little bit before they go in again to a whole host of cobblestone sections. The two leaders that we're looking at, Nico Matin in the white and blue jersey of Coffee Dish there with Hans de Klerk from Lotto, are around about 20 seconds ahead of a group of six riders as we rejoin now Johan Museo's group. He's looking over his shoulder to see what sort of damage. He's shouting to the other riders to work as hard as possible right now. Mikkelsen is in the group. Hincapi is in the group, and if we can have another quick look, we will probably see that Surveys Carnarvon, and there he is, wearing number one as last year's winner, is in this break. This is absolutely remarkable as Hincapi is in with the same men he was in the leading group with last year. Yes, well, earlier I was saying that things were going the way of George Hincapi, but look at that line up now at Museo uh, getting uh, the man who won last year, Surveys Carnarvon, in with him. Carnarvon is a big surprise to us all. It was reported over the weekend he was out after his bizarre accident when he hit a child in an underpass while out training, seemed to be too injured. Out came the sun and out came Carnarvon, and here he is now in a chase group with Museo, Hincapi, and Lars Miegelson, who told me again, Wavelgum, he has tremendous form this year and he's never been outside the top 20. Now, tactically, things are starting to look rather bad for George Hincapi because there are two more Domo riders up the road. Let's not forget, they were in that early morning breakaway, Max van Hazewijk and Enrico Cassani. So when all of these groups come back together, there are going to be four riders from Domo Farm Freets. There will be two riders from U.S. Postal Service, George Hincapi and Tom Boonen. So now it looks as if the team of the classics, Domo Farm Freets, have had the tactical advantage tip across to their side once again. And the rider just picked up there is coming back from the break where I think it was possibly uh, Talabardon who has just been caught from the front group and has come back into the back. No, it's number 93. So that's a CSC rider who slipped away outside of our view. So uh, he's come into this group now and I don't quite know where he popped up from but it's like that in Paris Bay. This is Tristan Hoffman, original member of the breakaway. And just look at these boys now cutting a steady trail through. We're picking up all of the riders who've had their share of falls as well today. This is Hans de Klerk now back here. So he really didn't enjoy his last couple of stretches of cobblestones, Paul. He certainly didn't, but you know, this race is now starting to come back together because this group now that we're looking at here with Hincapi, Museo and Carnarvon are not very much more than one and a half minutes behind the leading two on the road, Nico Martin and Hans de Klerk. Well, they'll be thankful for a little bit of smooth road for the moment now as we cross over towards uh, Sector 11, which will take us through the, uh, the uh, track of the prayers, the Chemin des Prières. This is Max van Heeswijk, a second. Uh, Tom Boonen wants a little bit of a drink, and I can't blame him. This is the reforming of the breakaway at the front. Hans the Clerk is back. I must assume, too, that Nico Matan is back and they're reforming the breakaway. It's been a good break, though, and it's now down to just seven riders. Seven riders who remain from a leading group of 31 men who escaped after 31 kilometers of this bike race, and it really is going to be a treacherous run in towards the finish because, once again, Phil, the rain has come down here in the velodrome in Roubaix. It's a kind of race today when you certainly need to win on your own if you want to win this bike race because sprinting round this track here is going to be very dangerous for anybody because there's no way at all you can go up the slopes coming down towards this finishing straight. We're heading into Beuvray-la-Forêt. 
by a Sarzy Rosier, and that's going to take us into the last 65 kilometers now. Seven riders still looking extremely strong. This is Cassani, Van Heeswijk is his teammate, De Klerk, Matan, Schweder, the remnant of the 31, as Paul has said, and still looking good to me, all of them, Paul. Well, they have been in an ideal situation because for them, this race has been run off at a steady tempo. They haven't had to suffer the accelerations and decelerations that have been suffered by the rest of the group further back while they've sped up to try and get themselves into an ideal situation for each individual section of cobblestones. But what has happened for these guys is they've ridden everyone at a nice tempo and they will be a little fresher than the guys coming up from behind. But let's not forget the big names are starting to come up from behind right now. Hincapia Museo are not too much more than one and a half minutes in arrears as we come into the town of Orshi, which is 61 kilometers to go to the finishing line and still 11 more sections of cobblestones. The next section of cobblestones, by the way, is called the Chemin des Prières, which is the road of prayers. And I think one or two guys will be praying for the sun to come out, as it seems to have done here at Orshi. But here in Roubaix on the finish line, the heavens have opened. Yes, it has. At least they're in the dry, which is more important, I suspect. We're into uh, Berry la forêt which is the second feed of the day. Time to reassess the situation now. Take on food, ready for the final battle and the last 65 kilometers. This is Hans de Klerk. He's made one move. Can he make another one? Fred Rodriguez, now hardly recognizable, covered in the mud of Roubaix. He's bounced his way towards Roubaix today so far because he's also had two punctures that we know of. So he's had two punctures and a fall. Meanwhile, back at the team car here of the Cofferdis boys, as they try now to just settle down, having all taken on their food at the feeding station, and they're packing in now for the last 65 kilometers of cycling. They've just had around about a 10 kilometer stretch of good road, which is why many of them now are just slowing back and looking back to the team cars to make sure they're getting themselves loaded up with food and drink for the next time. Because once they go into the Chemin de Prière, they've got a lot of cobblestone sections very close together. This is a time for everybody to get a rough idea and try and understand what is going on in the bike race. Because despite all the communications that these teams have nowadays, Paris-Roubaix is a very complicated and difficult bike race to understand. You're never really quite sure who's at the front and who's at the back of the race. You see the mechanic here. This is another big problem when you get a wet Paris-Roubaix. The mechanic there just putting a little more oil onto the cluster and the, and the chain there because it gets full of grit, it gets full of mud, and it tends to make an awful grinding noise, which really does tend to, tend to work out on your brain just a little bit. Matan now has decided enough is enough. Let's get this race organized. There you can see is Enrico Cassani. This is Bodrogi He's coming been forward. Down. He's <laughs> every one of these bike riders, I think, has been on the ground so far. Let's look at the state. The washing is a uh, priority at the end of any Paris-Roubaix, I think, and I'm never sure whether the equipment's worth washing because it's so badly damaged by the time you get down there. It's a mechanic and, uh, and the washer-up's nightmare. Well, the breakaway, De Klerk, uh, Cassani, Matan, Schweder, Hoffman, Tim Tombunen and Max van Heeswijk. Just a little bit of a recuperation sector here before they go into the final showdown. We're heading across uh, to the Chemin des Prières, which is sector number 11. And the George Hincapi group, Paul, I believe, is closing in pretty quickly now. Down to 55 seconds, so in the next section of cobblestones or so, we should see George Hincapi, Museo and Carnarvon at the front of this bike race. You can see there that the US Postal team car is up alongside Boonen. They've obviously told him to cut down and to make sure that they don't do too much work because the race is about to change and we're about to see a whole lot of new faces at the front. And so this is another selected group. This is group number two. And there is Johan driving on nicely as well as he may because he reads a bike race so well. And uh, the leader here, Team Coast, Lars Mikkelsen, Max Chandry. This is a very, very strong group. Now, Max, we'd love him to do a ride. He is such a good bike rider. He's the only British rider left in, I think. Jeremy Hunt started, but he said he would not make the distance. He's not been feeling at all well. There's Freddy Rodriguez as well, and he is covered with all the mud of the last sector of cobblestones. Max has got himself into a good move here and prepared to work. And so too is Lars Mikkelsen as the gap is down to 50 seconds. <laughs> 